In this video, I'm going to show you guys how to upload a new DNA sequence into Benchling and then how to attach primers to that sequence for virtual PCR. If you guys would like to know how to design primers from scratch in Benchling, there's actually another video that you can check out that covers that. Programs like this are really helpful because they allow us to try out different restriction sequences and primer sequences to help ensure a successful ligation before actually physically purchasing the primers. Now, you guys actually have it a lot easier. The primers we're using in our cloning project have already been designed for you, but it's important that you understand the concepts and know how to use this program. So first I wanna show you how to import a new DNA sequence. So I'm gonna open the project that I would like to add this sequence to. For you guys, it should always be your example project. And then I'm gonna select this plus sign here and go to new DNA sequence. In this field, I can rename my sequence and then simply copy and paste a DNA sequence. So you guys could copy the GFP sequence from your lab manual or the reading with this video. If you decide to do that, make sure you select a linear topology. Another way to import a DNA sequence would be to simply upload the sequence file. You could also import um, from a database such as NCBI, other websites, or even search for the gene name. However, I would like to work with the full plasmid sequence as our template because that's what we're actually doing in lab. So I'm gonna go back to my projects file and go into my template. And once again, we're going to select the plasmid we want to work with and simply copy it over. You should rename this with your initials and then we're going to duplicate it. Now when I go into my example project, I can find it right here. So the nice thing about working with the full plasmid sequence is not only does it give us an accurate representation of what we're doing here, but it also has a lot of these features already annotated. So we can see like all plasmids, it has an origin of replication. It also has a antibiotic resistance gene here. And here we see the GFP gene of interest that we're gonna amplify from this plasmid. So when I click on that region um, and take a closer look, I can see that actually the first codon here, ATG, is our start codon. So that codes for methionine. And I'm gonna go ahead and create an annotation. Just to make things really clear for myself. And when I scroll down here, I can see that these three nucleotides here, TAA, which would of course um, be transcribed into UAA in the mRNA sequence, code for one of the three stop codons. So I'm gonna go ahead and create an annotation for that one as well, just so we always have our bearings here. Because of course, we wanna make sure that our amplified sequence incorporates everything in between and including both the start and stop codons. So we're gonna be using NDE1 and EGOR1 to clone into the PET28A plasmid. So we need to make sure that our amplified sequence also has these restriction sequences flanking the coding region. Now, when we selected these restriction enzymes, we had to consider several factors. So the first one being is we needed to make sure we were selecting restriction sequences that were not already present within the coding region of the gene we want to amplify and clone. Because of course, after amplification, we're going to be digesting our PCR product in order to later ligate it into the PET28A plasmid, and we don't want to end up cutting our product in half. So we can actually check that really easily by selecting this annotated gene, going into our digest function here, and simply searching for each enzyme or sequence. So I can see there is one here, however, it's actually not within the coding region of the gene, it's located elsewhere on the plasmid. And that's fine. We're just worried about the coding region of the gene because we're only going to amplify this sequence. So I should make sure that eco R1 is not present within the coding region. And of course I see one here 
just outside of the coding region of our GFP gene. This is actually really convenient because it's this sequence is ideally placed for this cloning project just downstream of the stop codon. Now, because we are using a plasmid template, actually there are many restriction sequences located downstream and just upstream of our GFP coding region. And that's because this was cloned in the multiple cloning site of this UV plasmid. So of course there's many unique restriction sequences. So as I said, that's really convenient for us but if you were using a natural source template, like for example, maybe bacterial genomic DNA, you would probably not get so lucky. So the other factor we need to consider is whether or not these sequences already exist within the PET28A multiple cloning site. So I can open up this plasmid sequence. So of course there's our EcoR1, that's great but I really have somewhat limited option in terms of the upstream restriction sequence. Remember that we do need to pick restriction sequences that are downstream of the T7 promoter and LAC operator here, but we also need it to be downstream and in frame with this HIST tag because we want to fuse our six histidine residues to our express protein. So we're really limited to just these few here. So looking back at our plasmid template sequence, we know that we're going to have to somehow incorporate the NDE1 or NDL restriction sequence into our amplified product, and we have to do that through the primer design. So once you have your GFP template sequence open, you can head over to the primer design tool and create primers manually. You wanna make sure you change the, this to primer pair. And at this point, you can simply type in the forward and reverse primer sequences directly from your lab manual. Or um, I find the easier way to do it actually is to select the region that corresponds to the primer sequence. In this case, we're working looking at the forward primer and then head over here to the top right, hit set from selection, we want the forward primer, and that's gonna copy that region right over. At this point, you can make adjustments to this primer sequence as needed in order to create mismatches that are present in these GFP primers. So we're gonna do the same thing for the reverse primer. So I'm going to select the region here. Keep in mind that I'm not actually selecting the correct region. I'm just randomly selecting a sequence here. You do need to make sure it's the correct one from your lab manual. It's also worth noting that the reverse primer is the reverse complement of the strand sequence provided here. So you have to take that into account when you're selecting the region for the reverse primer or you can use this little workaround, just simply select the drop down menu next to the settings icon and click on the complement so that you can then see both strands of the template sequence, which makes it a little easier to select the correct uh, primer sequence. Okay, so once you have that correct region selected, again, we set from selection, reverse primer, and again, we can see the primer information listed here. And now we have a product size as well as uh, this gives us the difference in melting temperatures between these two primers. So at this point, you're done adding these primers. You simply want to give your primers a name and save them. Again, it's always gonna be in your example project. You can create a new folder within this. We're gonna do the same thing here. And this time I have to select example project and then go back to find my new folder that I just created in order to select that and save them both to the correct folder. So I save primer pair. Now I can find my primers within my projects here in order to take a screenshot. And that's it. That's all you need for lab assignment two in terms of the GFP primer analysis.